church. And we're getting back, finally, to part 43 of Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert, because the last time we were there was October 7th. So many specials have been going on. The October the 14th was our creation conference with Joel Tay from Creation Ministries International. October 21st was our missions conference with uh, uh, Reverend Keith Coleman. And then uh, last week was Reformation Sunday, so I preached a message on the Reformation, Reformed by God, uh, out of 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19. So today we're back to Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert, part 43. But as I said, it's International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. You may not be aware of it, but today as we speak, there are 215 million Christians who are suffering severe persecution around the world. That's about two-thirds of the population of the United States of America. Do you understand why the upcoming election on Tuesday is so critical? Do you want to become part of the group of persecuted Christians? Oh, there's mild persecution now from certain groups, but are you aware that the number of Christians killed worldwide because they refuse to renounce Christ has doubled in the last 12 months? Yes, doubled in the last year, the number of Christians who are killed for their faith. Turkey, tonight, we're going to see the video because this is praying for the persecuted church. We're going to see the video entitled Malatya. It's the true story of three Bible distributors in the city of Malatya, Turkey, who were tortured and murdered in the Bible distribution office, which was legal, legal there because Turkey claims to be a secular country. But they were, they were tortured and murdered by five radical Muslim teenagers. It hasn't stopped, as you know, Pastor Andrew Brunson, American citizen who ministered for 23 years in a church in Turkey, was arrested and imprisoned for two years on false charges. If he had been convicted in court, he would have received up to 35 years to life in prison. The least sentence he would have gotten was 35 years. He could have gotten life in prison. He was only released about three weeks ago on October 12th, 2018, because of intense worldwide prayer and super high pressure put on the Turkish government with threatened U.S. sanctions. Turkey is still a haven for Muslim extremists, even though it theoretically is a secular state with freedom of religion. I'm sure you're aware of the Saudi journalist who had criticized the Saudi regime, but he was murdered there in Turkey and dismembered a few weeks ago when he went to the Saudi consulate to get a marriage license. So one of the two films that we're going to look at tonight is about persecuted Christians in Turkey. Pakistan. The second film deals with the persecution of Christians in Pakistan. It's very short. It's only six minutes long. The first one is a full feature, but it's entitled Fasal of Pakistan. Pakistan is again in the news because of the recent release of Asiya Bibi. It looks like Asia bye-bye, but it's pronounced Asiya Bibi. She's a Christian who spent the last eight years in solitary confinement in prison because eight years ago, in 2010, she argued with one of her Muslim neighbors who then, I suppose out of spite, claimed that she had blasphemed the prophet Muhammad. She was condemned to death by a lower court and the appeals took eight years to reach the Pakistani Supreme Court. A three-judge panel of the Pakistani Supreme Court finally acquitted her, stating that there was not enough evidence to prove that she actually committed the so-called crime of blaspheming the Prophet Muhammad. This set off a huge tidal wave of Muslim protests by hundreds of thousands of Muslims who burned hundreds of buildings, school cars, schools, cars, private property, and rioted all over Pakistan. They even caused the capital to be shut down. All because the Supreme Court said she wasn't guilty. There wasn't enough evidence to prove she was guilty. Due to the riots, the president of Pakistan has issued an order that Asiya Bibi may not leave the country. And many now fear for her life from the hands of murderous radicals. As far as I know, as I preach, she's still alive today. You need to pray for her. It looks like Asia bye-bye. 
B-I-B-I, A-S-I-A-B-I-B-I. God knows who you're talking about. It's a Sia B-B. You need to be here tonight to see these films and learn how to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be in prayer also for this upcoming election just two days from now. As I said last week, if you're not registered to vote, you are sinning. You're sinning worse if you don't vote. If you're 18 and over, you should be registered to vote, and you need to vote your Christian values. You need to know something about the politicians, about the people who are running at every level of government. Are you going to vote? How old are you? Say, well, I'm past the age of voting. No, you're not. Doesn't matter how old you are. You need to be there and vote. Vote for righteousness. Vote for holiness. Vote for biblical standards. Men and women who will uphold the standards set by the Bible. And you need to pray. Pray for those in authority. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 says that we're to pray for kings and all those in authority over us. Pray for your leaders. At least four things, that they would have wisdom to conduct the affairs of state according to the word of God. Number two, that they would be ethical and fair in their dealings. Number three, that they would live in awe and reverence of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. That's Proverbs 1.7. Pray that God would bless and protect their families. You know, politicians make decisions sometimes based on threats against their families. There's a strong temptation to try to protect your own before you do what's right for your country. And then vote. It's a biblical principle. It has a very significant impact. When we vote to help select those who represent us, lead our government and make laws and protect our freedoms, we are going back to Exodus 18.22 where the people were commanded, select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men, who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Acts 6, verse 3. Select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to do this duty. America is a constitutional republic, and our practice of choosing leaders to represent and serve us is a biblical principle. Let me give you just the big picture. I know, I, I'm getting back to Exodus in a couple of minutes, but I, I want to say something because it's essential. Dear people, do you want to join the ranks of those who are severely persecuted around the world? Well, you can help prevent that by what you do this coming Tuesday. 35 U.S. Senate seats are up for election this year, and the current majority favors the GOP by a slim 51 to 49 majority. Polling uh, shows many U.S. Senate races very close. In fact, the Obamacare repeal and Planned Parenthood defunding failed in the Senate by one vote in 2017. One more conservative vote could make these realities. On the federal level, all 435 U.S. House races are up for election. The Cook Political Report is rating over 100 U.S. House races competitive. They are projecting many close races. On the state level, there are 36 governor races this year and state. 87 of 99 state legislative cham chambers have elections. Approximately 82% of state legislative seats in the country. On the local level, thousands of other important local races, city councils, school boards, and so on, are coming up for election. Have you even looked at the sample ballot that was sent to you in the mail if you're a registered voter? Have you looked at it? Do you know anything about the candidates? Why does every vote matter? The 2000 presidential election between George W. Bush and Al Gore was so close that people are still debating who won. 547 votes in Florida out of more than 105 million cast nationwide. 547 out of 105 million determined the outcome of that election. That election determined the president who would respond to the terrorist attacks on 9-11 and who would eventually choose two Supreme Court justices. Elections matter. Senator Bernie Sanders won his first race in the little town of Burlington, Vermont. He won by 10 votes. That win launched his political career, whose political career could start in 2018 with a 10-vote win in an unlikely place. Elections matter. 
Al Franken won the Minnesota U.S. Senate seat in 2008 by 312 votes out of 2.8 million that were cast. That gave the liberals 60 votes in the U.S. Senate, the exact number they needed to overcome a filibuster and pass Obamacare. The Virginia State House held elections in 2017, less than a year ago. Out of 100 seats, 50 had gone to the GOP and 49 to the Democrats. Control over the House came down to the race. When the votes were tallied, out of over 20,000 cast, it was exactly tied. They had to determine the winner by drawing the name out of a bowl. Republican David Yancey won the draw. Experts are predicting only 36% of eligible voters will vote in 2018. Can you imagine the difference? Just 10 to 15% more Christian voters could make. I hope you vote on Tuesday. If you don't, I pray God will judge you. And by the way, he will. Okay, so now we're back to Exodus. Over in Exodus chapter 15, we have been looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. The New Testament teaches that the ten failures of Israel and the other examples given in the Old Testament were written for us in the church. We finished up Rebellion Test 5, which was the golden calf incident at, at Horeb in Exodus chapter 32. And the final segment of that golden calf test was how the Old Testament event applies the sin unto death to that event. And it's a sin that is still available to the church, the sin unto death, as well as ancient Israel. We learned three key things from the golden calf event that connected the New Testament warnings about the sin unto death with our text in Exodus. One, in the Old Testament, God killed people who persisted in sin. That's, by the way, the key issue of the sin unto death. After they'd been warned multiple times, God always gives warnings. And Israel refused to listen to the warnings. The Jews obviously committed the sin unto death, God says so, because God killed them in their sins. Second, the thing we saw in 1 John 5, verses 16 and 17, was how both the Old Testament and the New Testament connect petitions and prayers to sin by telling us who we should pray for and who we should not pray for. And let me pause just to make that intersection one more time. Paul tells Timothy that we are to pray for those in authority over us that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and in honesty. Do you pray for our leaders every day. I gave you some samples of things that you could pray for them. Do you pray for them every day? Do you pray about those who will become our leaders in two days? That we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and honesty? Because if the wrong people are elected, wrong from our perspective, if the wrong people are elected, you will not be able to lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and in honesty. They will persecute you for it. We're not supposed to pray for some sinning Christians. In fact, we're supposed to stop praying for them. The sin unto death relates to God's people, not to the pagans. Three, the third thing that we have covered in detail was John himself tied the sin unto death directly back to the golden calf in 1 John 1, 21. It's the very last thing he writes about before writing the book of Revelation. We also analyzed the eight points of Moses' response and the actions. I won't go back over those eight points. Uh, I have given them to you. I hope you wrote them down. And I hope you've got your papers to take notes today. Moses was not afraid to tell the people that they had sinned, and he was not to take, afraid to take immediate action against the sin. God, uh, Moses then was willing to stand in the gap between God and the people and pray for them, even at the cost of his own life. He said, God, if you're not willing to forgive them, take my life instead. I'll be their substitute. A very beautiful illustration, by the way, of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died in our place as our substitute. And second, God reiterated a basic principle that applies not only to Moses, but also to us. God states the principles of blessing and judgment, that he doesn't crush everybody, but he only crushes the sinners. Exodus 32, 33, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. The third principle we learned was God does not grovel in anger after judgment is finished. God moves forward. In other words, the principle is for us, quit thinking about the past and what all the bad things are that other people have done to you. Turn it over to God and move forward 
Otherwise, you will always be wallowing in your own guilt. You'll always be wallowing in your own remorse. You'll always be wallowing in feeling sorry for yourself. You'll always be wallowing in feelings of revenge. And I'm going to get even with that person. And you'll waste your life. Turn it over to God. Casting all your care upon him. For he careth for you. Do it. And move on. Quit worrying about all those things. Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind and pressing forward. I reach for the mark, for the goal, for the prize in Christ Jesus. Quit wallowing in the past. That's how God works. That's how he's commanded us to work. Forgetting those things that are behind. Reach forward. Paul said, I'm running a race. Running a race doesn't mean running in place. Running a race doesn't mean running backward into all that junk that's back there. Running the race means pressing forward for the prize. Paul didn't want anybody to take it from him. I hope you don't want anybody to take that prize away from you as well. And fourth, the final principle we learned was people suffer when their leaders sin. And I think that's very appropriate in light of what is going on today. We see it worldwide. That's what this persecution stuff is about. But we'll see it here in America if we fail to exercise our responsibility of voting for righteous people in positions of authority. That's true in all spheres of authority that God has established. When the leaders in the home sin, the family suffers. When leaders in the church sin, the church suffers. When leaders in the workplace sin, like through embezzlement, the workers suffer. When the, those in leadership in government sin, the nation suffers. People always suffer when their leaders sin. That brought us to test number six, which we started back there on October 7th. The test at Taborah. And when the, this is Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. I asked you several questions, you recall, back way long ago in the Dark Ages when we preached the first messages on this section. The first question was, how often does God have to exercise his judgment before we get the point? We're already down to test number six, and they still haven't gotten the point. How long does he have to exercise judgment before they get the point? The second question was, since all suffering is not the result of sin, why do God's people fail to thank him for the trials of life, which he is using to conform them to the image of Christ? When was the last time you thanked God for suffering? Most of us don't, do we? Judgment requires repentance. Love requires thankful submission when you're going through times of suffering. You've got to determine which is it. Am I, be, am I going through this suffering because I've sinned? If so, the proper response is repentance. Or you say, why am I going through suffering? You say, well, God is doing this to conform me to the image of Christ. It's not as a result of sin. It's because... He's moving things out of my life so I can focus more perfectly on Jesus. If that's the case, it's an act of love on God's part, and he's calling you to submission. It's what we've called the pain of pruning, and Jesus talks about it in John chapter 15. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth fruit, beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Purging is pruning, cutting off pieces. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Now, the goal of Jesus for you is to bear fruit. We know what the fruit is. It's found in John 14, 15, and 16. Uh, and Paul summarizes it in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The ninefold fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, contrasted in Galatians 5 with the works of the flesh. 
if you look at John 14, 15, and 16, that's the upper room discourse, if you look at those three chapters, you'll find all ninefold fruit of the Spirit, Jesus talking about it in that passage. It's a magnificent, wonderful exposition of the fruit that God wants you to bear, and Jesus talks about it. He says, how are you going to bear it? Well, the father's the husbandman. That's the guy who cuts the bad branches off the vines. The father's going to come in and find things in your life that shouldn't be there because they're not producing fruit, and he's going to go, snip, 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 cut it off. Oh, here's another branch not bearing fruit. Snip, snip, snip. And when he does that, then as the sap flows through the vine, which is the Lord Jesus, and out into the branches, which are you and me, it begins to produce fruit. No more energy going into worthless branches but into branches that bear fruit. That's why sometimes we have pain brought into our lives. It's because Jesus wants us to bear fruit and he gets rid of the excess garbage that shouldn't be in our life, the stuff that's not bearing fruit. That's John 15. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me. Now here is what's happened to the trimmed off branches. He is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, tying it back to prayer, because that's what we were finishing up with. In the last session fruit bearing and answered prayer both hinge on abiding in Christ fruit bearing and answered prayer those things are twin brothers you cannot separate them they are stuck together fruit bearing and answered prayer both hinge on abiding in Christ Look at verse 7 of John 15. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, and that if controls both of those phrases, if you abide in me, and if my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Do you wonder sometimes while you, you pray away and you pray away and you don't get any answers to prayer? And the heavens are just sort of up there and cloudy and dark and you think, I wonder how far my prayers got. Maybe God's busy. Maybe God's listening someplace else. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, oh, maybe I'm not saved. Uh, no, maybe you're not abiding in Christ. Because if you don't abide in Christ, number one, you won't bear fruit. That's what verses one through six are all about. Number two, if you don't abide in Christ, you will not get answers to prayer. More than that, you cannot glorify God unless you're abounding with spiritual fruit. That's what Jesus said there in John 7. Second, you cannot be a disciple of Christ unless you are abounding with spiritual fruit. Oh, you may be a follower, but you're not a disciple. Too many fruitless Christians think they're glorifying God, and too many fruitless Christians think they're disciples of Christ just because they trusted Jesus for salvation. But you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ unless you are bearing much fruit. Say, oh, come on, Pastor, where do you see that? Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified. Okay, so we're going to talk about how you're going to glorify God. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so, so shall ye be my disciples. The proof of discipleship is the bearing of much fruit. Fruit, and some of us don't seem to be bearing any of it. You cannot glorify God unless you're abounding with spiritual fruit. And you cannot be a disciple unless you're abounding with spiritual fruit. Only the people who bear much fruit can be counted among the disciples. The rest are merely followers like the crowds who showed up for the free lunches, the crowds who showed up at the Dr. Jesus office, and the crowds who showed up to watch the miracle shows. What does it take 
to be a true disciple, bearing much fruit. That's indispensable. Now, how about the mechanics of bearing fruit? How do you do it? Verse 4, Jesus said, this is, we're back in John 15, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Abiding in Christ is the one essential key to bearing fruit. Bearing fruit is the key to glorifying God and being a disciple of Christ. So abiding in Christ is the one essential key to glorifying God and being a disciple of Christ. So how do we abide in Christ? Here's the mechanics. Jesus tells us in the next few verses there are three parts. Number one, having God's kind of love. Here are the mechanics. If you're going to write down the mechanics of how do you bear fruit. Number one, you've got to have God's kind of love. Number two, there has to be submission to the tests of life. Number three, there must be obedience to his commandments. Now remember the context, verses 1 through 8, is that business of bearing fruit and abiding in Christ and glorifying God. And verse 9 is where he starts to give you the mechanics as to how to do it. And those are the three things that you see there. Look at verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. What kind of love did the Father have for Jesus? It was an unbroken love that extends into eternity past. What kind of love did Jesus have for the disciples? It was a love that took him to the cross. What kind of love does he tell the disciples they're supposed to have? It's a little word, the word so. He says, you're going to continue the process. You're going to continue the chain. You're going to continue the reaction of love. So shall ye be my disciples. So continue ye in my love. You see, God is trying to develop in you the same kind of love that Christ had for you. You say, well, how do I know what that is? Have you ever read 1 Corinthians 13? 1 Corinthians 13 is a description of agape. That's the divine kind of love. There are other kinds of love, like eros. That's sensual love, like we get the word erotic from. There's philos, the Greek form of phileo, to, to love, uh, which is friendship kind of love, like in Philadelphia, means city of brotherly love. But then there's agape. There's also storge, which is family love, uh, but uh, that only occurs in the negative in the New Testament. It tells us that's one of the marks of apostates. They don't have that kind of love. They're willing to kill their own, as you see with abortions and euthanasia. But God says, I want you to have agape love. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians 13? Have you ever realized that that is the love of Christ? That's how he loved you. That's why you are commanded to have that kind of love. When you do that, so are you his disciples. When you have that kind of love, in that way, you glorify God. Did you realize that's the kind of love that a husband is supposed to have for his wife? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands, is that the way you love your wives? Not loving them for what you can get out of them, for how you can use them, for how you can get them to work while you sit home and munch on carrots or candy bars. How did Jesus love you? He was willing to die in your place. He was willing to protect you. 
to give you life. The Father loved Jesus. Jesus loved the disciples. And then he tells them, if you want to bear fruit, that's the first thing you've got to have. You've got to have that same life, love. Continue ye in my love. Specific applications. Husbands and wives. You're the living illustration of what it means to love like Jesus loved. When was the last time you went through 1 Corinthians 13 and said, what do each one of these words in the King James mean? When did you sit down and take a concordance and look some of those words up and trace them through the Bible? Is it because you say, oh, well, that's the love chapter and you move on? Without ever stopping to think? God summarized for me so I don't have to look all over the Bible for it. God summarized for me what I am supposed to be doing so that I can be a disciple, not just a follower, but be a disciple of Jesus. I encourage you today. Take 1 Corinthians 13. Sit down if you're a single, alone, and read it. Because you can apply that so that you can be a disciple, so that you can abide in Christ, so that you can glorify God, so that you will get yes answers to your prayers. If you're married, do it together with your spouse and say, are we manifesting this in our lives? And if you have children, are we showing our children what it means to love like Jesus loves? Dear people, if you bear no fruit, it's because you've never applied the mechanics as to how to bear fruit. That was number one, God's kind of love. There are three useful elements given in the verse. There's a comparison, there's an example, and there's a continuous imitation. Second, abiding in Christ requires obedience to his commandments just like the Jews were required to obey the Old Testament commandments of the law. Now, a few minutes ago, if I can find it here, I read that passage to you out of Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 22, let me get through all these stacks of papers that I have set up here. I'll see if I can find that verse for you again. Uh, it has disappeared somewhere. But uh, in Exodus chapter 22, remember, there were four things. There were four specific things that they were told, if you do this, and if you do this, and if you do this, and if you do this, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I have put upon the Egyptians. It was a matter of obeying. And if you obey those particular commandments, statutes, ordinances, and laws, you will not get the diseases that the Egyptians had because they didn't obey God's principles. Well, we move to the New Testament and we find Jesus talking about his commandments, and we find the results of abiding in Christ given in verses 10 and 11 when they obey. Look, verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So number one, the first part is God's kind of love. Number two, we find here obedience to the commandments of Christ. In the same way that he kept it. Now, did Jesus ever disobey the Father? Did he ever even once disobey the Father? He says, your responsibility is to obey my commandments even as that is in the same manner that I have obeyed my Father's commandments. And as a result, I abide in his love. You obey my commandments, you'll abide in my love. And then we find verse 11, magnificent verse. Why did Jesus tell us this? Because he wanted to make us miserable? Oh, no, we're going to have to obey Jesus. Can't we just do our own thing? If you obey Jesus, you know what happens? Look at verse 11, John 15. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Obeying Jesus 
doesn't bring misery. It doesn't bring deprivation. It doesn't bring confinement and restriction to what we want to do. What you want to do is what the flesh wants to do, and the flesh is not your friend, it's your enemy. Obeying Jesus brings joy. It not only brings joy, but it brings remaining, abiding joy, permanent joy. As long as you are walking in fellowship with him, obeying him, taking the steps that he wants you to take, doing what he wants you to do, not procrastinating, not holding it up, not turning the other direction, not going slightly off course. You know, one degree from a rocket on earth headed for the moon will get, not reach the moon. It will go up and it will go past the moon. In other words, doing exactly what he wants. You line your life up with what Jesus told us to do. And it brings joy because you are designed to be in fellowship with God. And when you're not in fellowship, oh, you may have some worldly happiness that's temporary, but you will not have joy. In Scripture, joy, I think I may have said this to you before, but I did a study once on joy throughout Scripture. In every occurrence where joy shows up with God's people, it's always in the midst of sign of trouble. You see, the light shines brightest against a dark background. The joy that Christ gives is something that will overcome the darkness. And that's how you see it in Scripture. When God's people go through trouble, instead of murmuring and groaning, moaning and complaining, we need to learn to give thanks. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. God is concerned with you. No matter what the circumstances of life are like, the issue is, will we give thanks because God is conforming us to the image of Christ? Now, if it's suffering because of sin, remember, we talked about that, there needs to be repentance because judgment is coming. If it's suffering because God is pruning the dead wood off of our lives, and he's moving us forward to become more and more like Jesus every day. We need to thank him and submit to him and say, Lord, please do it more. I want to be like Jesus. That's what Jesus is teaching here in John chapter 15. The implications are obvious. First, if we don't keep his commandments, we will not abide in his love. Second, if we don't keep his commandments, our joy will not be full. And so what are the commandments of Christ that must be obeyed? In contrast to and in comparison with the commandments that the Jews were required to obey, the Ten Commandments and all those laws of the Old Testament. Number one, what are the commandments that we have to obey? Number one, unwavering obedience to Christ just like he had unwavering obedience to the Father. That's your focus. Unwavering obedience. You may not understand all of it yet. You may not know where it's going to lead. But you make a commitment that when I understand, I will obey. If you don't make that commitment, if you say, well, I want to intellectually check it out first. I'm not going to obey anything. Uh, I mean, I may understand it, but, but I probably can find a loophole and I, I don't really have to obey it in this circumstance or in that circumstance or that situation. If you start like that, you will never have God's joy. You'll always be saying, there must be a loophole somewhere. Number two, what you need to obey is learning to love Christ in the same way that he loved the Father. And number three, loving with the exact same kind of love that he and the Father have as we love one another. Because the Bible commands that. We are to love one another, and that's the word agape, the divine kind of love. 
That's the kind of love that loves even unto death. That says, that's my brother in Christ. I'll take the bullet for him. That's my sister in Christ. There's only one spot left in the lifeboat. I give it to her. Did you realize that there were dozens of people on the Titanic that were believers and they gave up their seats in the lifeboat for others? There was one man, a pastor, who gave up his life jacket after he was already in the water and there was a man struggling near him who had no life jacket. And he took off his life jacket and gave it to the man and shared Christ with him before he disappeared into the dark waters of the North Atlantic. That's the kind of love that we are supposed to imitate. Would you do it? We are to love one another in the same way Jesus loved us. So the love extends both directions. It's a love upward toward Jesus. It's a love downward toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the same kind of love that God the Father had when he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Dear friend, have you experienced that kind of love from God? Or are you still on the outside criticizing the Bible, criticizing the church, criticizing other people, scorning what Jesus did, perhaps you are politically a Christian, you're a nominal Christian, but you have never trusted Jesus to save you from your sins. You keep holding on to your sins and saying, I'll trust him as an example. I'll trust him as a leader. I like his moral principles. But you've never trusted him to save you from your sins because you are not willing to admit that you are a sinner on your way to hell. The mechanics of being a disciple, not merely a follower. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment. In other words, it's not an option. Here's a commandment of Christ. Don't skip the word commandment. John 15, 12. We're still in that same passage about fruit bearing. This is my commandment. It's not an option. That you love one another as... I have loved you. Now let me point out the obvious. If you don't love other believers, you are in rebellion against Jesus. Let me say it again. If you don't love the brothers and sisters in Christ because he gave a command on that, you're in rebellion to Jesus. Verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now look at verse 14. How do you become a friend of Jesus? He tells you in verse 14, how do you become a friend of Jesus? Ye are my friends if, that's a big word, it shows there's some conditions. Whenever you see if in the Bible, it means there is a conditional clause attached. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Not if you 
pick and choose what you want to obey. Not if you want to test it out first by your own moral standards or by your own rationale and reason or by your own experience or by your emotions. Hear, my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Did you get that? Friendship with Jesus requires obedience. Some of you think you're friends of Jesus, but you insist on doing your own things. Sorry. What Jesus taught was that you're not his friend because you refuse to obey him. Well, I can't believe that our time is up, but that brings us to a third question, and I'll let you ponder it for a week, and I hope you ponder on it because someday it may cost you your life if you don't think about it now and come up with the right answer. We're talking about the sin of the death, why God killed Jews in the wilderness, why he kills Christians today. And here's the question. Why do God's people, especially today, not just the Jews in the wilderness, insist on walking in the flesh even though God has given us his indwelling Holy Spirit? Let me say the question again. Why do God's people, especially today, not just the Jews in the wilderness, say, oh yeah, those bad guys back then. No, 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 forget that. How does it apply? Why do Christians today insist on walking in the flesh even though God has given us his indwelling Holy Spirit? You do not have to walk in the flesh. You don't have to fulfill the lusts thereof. You are commanded to walk in the Spirit. You are commanded to walk by faith, not by sight. We'll have to pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. And we see these parallels between what happened to Israel in the Old Testament and what has happened to and is happening in and may happen here in the church. We pray, Father, that you will give us wisdom, not merely in knowing facts about the Bible, but understanding how it applies to our lives, how we are related to the Lord Jesus Christ, what are our obligations to him, what should be our thoughts, our words, our actions, our motives, our attitudes. What should we be like if we're going to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ and if we're truly going to be his disciples? Help us, Father, to bear fruit. Help us to walk by faith. Help us to rejoice in the pruning when you take bad stuff out of our lives and replace it with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We can't work those up ourselves. Christ is the vine, we're the branches. It's the Holy Spirit who flows through us and produces that, for that is the fruit of the Spirit. Father, we pray that you'll take your word and apply it to each of our hearts, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.